I've been asked to conclude our conference speaking on the foundation of mission. And uh, that's, a, that's a great uh, topic, and it follows on in some ways very nicely uh, from the wonderful address we heard last um, that was inspired by that final line of Psalm 11, the upright shall behold his face. What an encouragement, what a promise, how wonderfully uh, developed in Psalm 27. And then Psalm 27 ends with those words of encouragement and direction, wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage, wait for the Lord. And uh, so in some ways I think my assignment is, what should we do while we're waiting? Obviously we should trust the Lord and hope in the Lord. Uh, be patient before the Lord, wait for the Lord, but we should also be active. And uh, as we wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to return, we should be people concerned to make our God known. And um, Psalm 11 in so so many ways encourages us in that because it's such a hope-filled psalm. I hope you saw that as we went along looking at it from so many different angles, but how how hope-filled we should be as the people of God. Uh, We must not despair. We must not be afraid. We must be a people filled with hope and confident of what the Lord is going to accomplish, and therefore to be confident as we wait that we can call the world to repentance and to faith. Uh, to offer hope to all to whom we can speak. And so we are called as the people of God to offer hope to all peoples, to offer hope to all peoples. And uh, that's expressed in in an interesting way in Psalm 9, verse 11. I've, I've argued that Psalm 9 and 10 are really important background to what is developed in Psalm 11. And Psalm 9, verse 11 says, Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. All peoples need to hear the deeds of the Lord. And uh, we are called to make that known as effectively and as broadly as possible. Um, Psalms 9 and 10 often talk about the judgment that will fall on the nations. Um, But before the judgment comes, the Psalms over and over again tell us to make the deeds of the Lord known and call the nations to repentance. Although there are strong imprecatory Psalms, the imprecatory Psalms are always in the context of Psalms that call people to repentance first. Our hope should always be that the vilest of sinners will repent and come to know the Lord. And that's part of what we should pursue. One of my earliest experiences with Ligonier as I began to speak at conferences was um, the agony of book signings. because I didn't have very many books. (laughs) And so I used to refer to it as the annual humiliation. (laughs) Sit while all my fellow speakers are signing books with long lines and I'm fiddling with my pen. I expect you to feel sorry for me (laughs) and to think that I'm more than a little pathetic. And then I discovered that uh, these book signers always had a Bible verse to write below their signature, and I felt so spiritually inadequate. Um, So I thought, well, I've got to find a Bible verse. And um, there are a lot of them. (laughs) And uh, so the verse that... uh, spoke to me, and I still write in, in, in Bibles, uh, is Psalm 9, verse 10. 
And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Isn't that a wonderful verse? I really like that verse. Uh, what a what a universal offer of the gospel it contains. God does not forsake those who seek him. If you're seeking the Lord, he will not forsake you. He will hear you. We should be greatly encouraged in that truth. And then for a time, I wasn't at a conference, and I went to a book signing, and the first person came up, and I sort of panicked. I couldn't remember what my verse was. <laughs> it was a very nice young lady. And so I thought and thought, and I wrote down Psalm 10, verse 11, instead of Psalm 9, verse 10. And as she walked away, I thought, I did that wrong. And I thought, well, it is a Bible verse. <laughs> I hope it's a good one. <laughs> I looked it up, and it says, he says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. <laughs> I had to publicly announce it and ask her to change it in her book but I've never forgotten my verse since. <laughs> well, these verses are, are verses of encouragement. They're verses of hope. They're verses that, that remind us of the gracious spirit of the Lord, of the, of the call of the Lord on his people. Uh, one of the things I discovered, I recently did a teaching series uh, on the book of Romans that's gonna come out in a few months. And one of the things I discovered there is that in the section of Scripture uh, that is Romans 9 through 11, uh, a section that is heavy and can be dense and can be complicated and can be uh, difficult and can sometimes for some people be intimidating, at the very center, at the very heart of that section, Romans 9 through 11, Paul has a verse that he quotes from Joel, chapter 2. And so if you're not sure about predestination, if you're not sure about the future of Israel, if uh, Paul's discussion in 9 through 11 sometimes isn't perfectly clear to you, Paul at the center says, remember this one verse, Romans 10, verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're not sure if you're elect, know this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're not sure if you're part of Israel or part of the Gentiles or part of who knows what, know this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our God is an encouraging God. Our God offers hope to everyone who will call upon him. And uh, the Psalter does that. The scripture from beginning to end does that. And, and one of the uh, delights of the Old Testament and of the Psalter is the anticipation that a day is coming when the nations will be joined to Israel. That's promised in the Old Testament. It is promised that the good news of salvation and the covenant of grace was never intended only for Israel, that Israel was the preparation for the coming of the day when the nations would be brought in and joined to Israel. And we see that so magnificently expressed in Psalm 87. Psalm 87 verse 4 says, among those who know me, I mention Rahab. Now, Rahab's uh, an Old Testament name for, alternative name for Egypt. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab and Babylon. 
Behold Philistia with Tyre and Cush. Now think about that for a minute. The psalmist is looking forward to a day when Egypt and Babylon and Philistia would belong to God. Now, who are Egypt and Babylon and Philistia? They are the great ancient enemies of God's people. They are the people who opposed Israel, who opposed God, who tried to destroy Israel. You can read Psalm 83 and see that destructive purpose. But the destructive purpose will not be the last word. Egypt and Babylon, and Philistia, and even faraway Cush will belong to God. And how will they belong to God? Will they be illegal aliens in Jerusalem? Will they be naturalized citizens in Jerusalem? No. They will be treated as those born there. God has a purpose in this world, and the purpose is to gather his elect from every nation and tribe and tongue and people, and to make one new man out of them, to bring all of the Gentiles who are saved into being part of the commonwealth of Israel. Israel is not replaced. Israel is expanded uh, to include Gentiles as well as Jews. I don't know what our dispensational friends do with Psalm 87, but they can't do right uh, because God intends no wall between Jew and Gentile, but in Christ one new man uh, where we are united because while we wait, we make God known. Uh, the New Testament refers to the mystery of the inclusion of the Gentiles. Paul talks about that in Ephesians 2 and 3. But when we read that carefully, what we discover is the mystery of the inclusion of the Gentiles in the saving purpose of God was not a mystery to the Jews, it was a mystery to the Gentiles. The Jews already knew about it if they read Psalm 87. Uh, they knew all about it if they read Genesis, didn't they? What was the promise to Abraham? That in him, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so, there's hope. While we wait for the coming of the Savior, there's hope. And it doesn't matter how bad things may be, in the world in which we live, there is hope that the Spirit of God will be at work converting people to Himself. And that happens, doesn't it? That happens, doesn't it? Uh, we had a wonderful example of that in our congregation some time ago, where we had professions of faith. Now, we've always had a very diverse congregation here. We had people who came from all different parts of the Netherlands. <laughs> and we had four people making professions of faith, three from China and one from India. And what a blessing that was to think that now these Chinese and Indian Christians are Dutch. <laughs> no, no, no. I can make these jokes because I'm not Dutch. I pretend to be Dutch from time to time, but I'm not actually. But what a wonderful thing to see displayed for us how people are being drawn from all parts of the earth to the Savior and to find life in Him. So there's this, this broad hope that's laid out in the Scriptures of calling people to faith and to hope in Jesus Christ. But in Psalm, one, uh, Psalm 11 itself, we see a very distinctive presentation 
of the hope that we can declare. And I hope this will be practically helpful, because I think sometimes uh, we can get kind of tongue-tied when we try to talk to people about the Lord. Uh, We're not quite sure where we should start or what we should say, exactly uh, uh, how we might approach things. And I think Psalm 11 actually is quite helpful, especially uh, in the way that it helps us to speak to the situation we face today. Some of what's in the Psalter is remarkably, remarkably modern sounding. And uh, Psalm 11 is prepared precisely to answer some of the challenges to the faith some of the challenges to hope that uh, the psalmist faced in the ancient world and we face in the modern world. And um, I would draw your attention to three statements that we find in uh, Psalm 10 in particular. And the first statement we find in Psalm 10 is at verse 4, In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek God. All his thoughts are, there is no God. All of the thoughts of the wicked are, there is no God. Now, that sounds pretty modern, doesn't it? The contention that there is no God. And Psalm 11, I think at verse 4, is a precise answer to that contention of the wicked. The wicked says there is no God, and what does Psalm 4 say? Psalm 11, verse 4 say, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. There is a God. There is a God who rules. There is a God who is supreme. There is a God over all things. And what a blessing it is to know that. What a comfort it is to know that. How striking it is that moderns, having denied the existence of God, find themselves in a universe that has become huge from their own study and the insight of their science. And the larger that universe is, the lonelier they feel. I've always been fascinated by the fascination some people have with extraterrestrials. Is there life on other planets? Do they have rocket ships? Did they crash in New Mexico? (laughs) Is that where the forest fire in New Mexico came from? Why is there this bizarre fascination with aliens? You know, that alien is just a Latin word that means others. Why are we so concerned about the others who might be out there? Because we're desperate not to be alone. We're desperate to prove that evolution can produce other people than just us. I personally think that's one of the evidences of God's sense of humor. You've developed this whole theory of evolution, and it's disproved every time you look into a telescope. Because if evolution is true, there have to be little beings. They don't have to be green, but there have to be little beings on other planets. We can't be unique. That would be terrible. But despite all of the effort to find life on other planets, we are left alone if there is no God. But there is a God. That's what the Scripture tells us. There is a God. 
That's what Psalm 11 tells us. And he is a God who is in his temple, in his place of holiness, in his place of access for us. There is a God, and his throne is in heaven. How wonderful. How wonderful. Now, it may be true there's no actual throne in heaven. It may be true that God isn't limited to heaven. You know that, don't you? God's everywhere. And God does not have a bottom that needs a seat. What is being said here? It's that our God is so glorious that he is enthroned in the world and universe that he has made. He's above it. He's beyond it. He's glorious in it. He rules over it. And so we're not alone. We're not alone. But we belong. You know, that's what's so sad about being alone. You don't belong to anyone or anywhere but we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. As the first question of the catechism says. <laughs> what a wonderful thing to know that we belong, that we're not alone, that we don't live in an utterly impersonal universe. You know, most moderns really do not want to think about that, that this universe is utterly impersonal, and therefore utterly indifferent. Who was it? Was it uh, Stephen Crane? Someone wrote a little poem that said, I said to the universe, I am. And the universe said back, what is that to me? That's the modern world, except that moderns don't want to really think about it. And then Psalm 10, verse 11, has the wicked saying in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. So the wicked say, even if there is a God, he doesn't care. He doesn't look. He doesn't notice. He doesn't take account. And you see again how Psalm 11 specifically answers that contention of the wicked. Psalm 11 verses 4 and 5 said, His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked. I could almost see my mother when Pastor Parsons was preaching last night and talked about the eyelids, I could see my mother narrowing her eyes at me. I bet most of you who've had parents have memories of eyes being narrowed, focused, noticing, taking account, and those narrowed eyelids usually lead to some activity in the lips something to say. You see, God does take account. God, God does take account. And so we live in a universe that is not only personal, because we have a God enthroned in heaven, but we live in a universe that is moral. God is noticing what is going on. God has a standard for testing what is going on, for evaluating what it is that we do and think and say. And what a blessed reality that is, that that is true. If the universe were not a moral universe, it would be utterly brutish. Right would be what might can establish. Morality would be power. 
And that, too, is really hideous to contemplate as a world in which to live. Who is moral in the struggle between Russia and the Ukraine? If this is an amoral universe, whoever wins is the moral one. But that's not true, is it? Putin doesn't establish morality. You don't establish morality. Not even I establish morality. God establishes what is moral, what will stand the test. And the glorious thing, well, one of the glorious things that we possess is the revelation of God where he has told us that of which he approves. You know, there's a, a twofold lie that dominates much of the modern world. <clears throat> First, that there is no God, and secondly, if there is a God, he does not speak. And the scriptures from beginning to end say both of those propositions are utterly false. There is a God. He's enthroned in heaven. And that God tests the deeds of men and he loves righteous deeds. And he's revealed to us what is righteous, what is pleasing to him, so that we have objective right and wrong. Again, we have long lived in a culture where right and wrong were borrowed from Christianity and still had a measure of cultural influence. But today, increasingly, we live in a culture that has thrown away those borrowed standards and has sought to set up their own standards as to what is right and wrong. And those borrowed standards are fought over in the streets. Those borrowed standards are brutish in their consequences. And what a blessing it is that we have hope, not only that there is a God, but that he has spoken and has told us what true morality is that we should pursue. And then Psalm 10, verse 13 writes, why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? So first the wicked says, there is no God. And then the wicked have a fallback position. If there is a God, he doesn't notice or see. And then the wicked have a third fallback position to say, even if there is a God and he notices and sees, he'll never call to account. You'll never have to face judgment for what you have done. This all sounds really modern, doesn't it? This is what we hear all the time. If there is a God, he will be so glad we pay a little attention to him that he'll just delight in us. It's not what the scriptures say. What does Psalm 11 say as an answer to this? The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. You know where that language comes from, that language of judgment in verse 6 of Psalm 11? Rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind. That's the language of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, moderns don't know much about the Bible, 
but people still know something about Sodom and Gomorrah. They know something about the judgment visited on Sodom and Gomorrah. That judgment, in a sense, gave birth to the notion of hellfire and damnation preaching, brimstone preaching. And we don't do that anymore. God has changed. No, God has not changed. That's what this text tells us. That the God who visited hellfire on Sodom and Gomorrah will visit hellfire on the wicked. Judgment is coming. God will hold to account. Because this world, this universe that God has made is not only personal, because God is in it and sovereign over it, is not only moral, because God has established the moral standards of that universe, but this world is also purposeful. It's going somewhere. And again, what, what do the moderns have to say? They say the world is pointless. Either goes round and round in a circle, or is just drifting with no purpose, no end, no point. And the Bible says, oh, God has a purpose because this world is going somewhere. It's going either to heaven or to hell. It's going either to blessedness or to woe. And you know, I think we should be filled with hope as we think about these things because these are the things that give us a message to the world. Because the truth is that the modern world, for all of its pride and all of its tendency to self-satisfaction, is left with this horrible vision of reality that the world is impersonal and amoral and pointless. Is that good news for anybody? Is that hopeful for anybody? Is that the reality that anybody really wants to live in? What a message we have. What a message we have that there is a God enthroned in heaven who sees what is happening in this world and will bring it to a conclusion one day. What wonderful deeds we have to tell of the Lord, that he is the creator, he is the sustainer, he is the fulfiller of life, and he gives us hope. He gives us hope. What a blessedness that is. What an encouragement that should be to us. And this is one way we can seek to fulfill our mission by talking about the personal God who directs us in life and will give us the grace that will lead us on to an eternal life. And that should be a hopeful and joy-filled mission for us to fulfill. I think that sometimes we as Christians see the call to speaking for the Lord and doing evangelism as a sort of grim duty. The Great Commission. The Great Commission was given that we could feel guilty all the time for not speaking enough about the Savior. Come on, now let's be honest. Is it a grim duty? Is it a grim duty? No, the Lord wants us to see it as this wonderful gift that we're given 
to make Jesus known while we're waiting for him to return. And, um, you know, as we, we look at the ends of the Gospels, the end of each Gospel, in its different way, calls us to speak for Jesus. It's not just the end of Matthew's gospel that gives us the great commission that calls us to speak for Jesus, but the end of each of the four gospels has its own distinctive call to speak for Jesus. I'm always sort of fascinated by the way Mark's gospel ends. Now there's some debate exactly how Mark's gospel ends, but I know I think Mark's gospel really ends with verse 8 of chapter 16. The women have seen the angel at the empty tomb, and verse 8 says, they, the women, notice it's the women, the disciples are nowhere to be seen. The disciples haven't been around for a long time. It's the women who remain faithful. And the women went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I think that's where it ends. Now, many in the church have said, can't end there. That's impossible. It ends there precisely because it's impossible. It ends there so that everyone reading it will say, it can't end there. So everyone will say as they read it, we can't be afraid and say nothing to anyone. We're not afraid. And so we say things to people. You see, the Gospels were written years and years after the church had been established and after people had been preaching and after many people had come to faith. So everybody who read Mark's gospel knew that that was not the end of the story. That people weren't forever afraid and forever silent, but filled with faith and confidence, they began to talk. And so Mark says to all of us, don't be afraid. Speak up. That's what must follow on the resurrection of Jesus. And so there's that encouragement. But maybe most encouraging is the end of Luke's gospel, where the risen Christ has said that they're to go and preach repentance and forgiveness of sins in his name. And how did the disciples react there at the end of Luke's gospel. They saw the ascension. They knew that Jesus was glorified. They knew that Jesus was enthroned in heaven. And they were filled with joy. And they worshiped and blessed God and went about the business of making him known. That's what we're called to while we wait. That's what we're called to in these days. And so, we should be filled with hope. And that hope should lead us to praise. And that praise should be an infectious way of speaking about the Lord. I think singing is one of the most important ways we give testimony to our faith and to our conviction that we live in a world that is personal and moral and purposeful. Psalm 9 begins, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And I think if more people could have been here to hear you singing in these last two days, hearts would have been moved to say, wow, there's something about those people. Either they're completely crazy or they know the truth. And what a blessing it is that we can be a hope-filled people, filled with praise, 
filled with joy and singing and speaking about our God and his purpose because we serve a God who is alive and reigning and accomplishing his purpose and filling us with joy and with hope. Praise God. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, how amazed we are that your scriptures show us so clearly that you had a purpose in which you knew the end from the beginning, in which you are accomplishing your purpose, in which you are glorifying your Christ as our hope and our Savior, that you are filling us with joy and praise in your service. And our great prayer is, O Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But while we wait for our Savior to come, may our lives and may our words be constant testimony that there is a Savior, there is a God, there is a God who sees, and there is a God who judges, and there is a God who has provided a Savior for, to rescue everyone who rests in him from the judgment to come. O oh Lord, may our lives and our words be a testimony to that great truth, and may you be glorified. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.